Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, today's distinguished seminar. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Xu Mei Jia from uh, University of uh, Wisconsin Medicine. Professor Jia is someone who does not need a much introduction, especially for students who have taken my courses, because I have been teaching some of his uh, research results in my courses. <laughs> So I will just briefly uh, introduce him. Um, Professor Jia um, received his bachelor degree from IIT in India and a PhD from CMU under the supervision of Professor Edmund Clark, who is a Tuning Award winner. By the way, Professor Edmund Clark was actually a faculty at Duke <laughs> before he moved to Harvard and, CM and then CMU. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I got this from Wikipedia. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> yeah. Professor Jia's uh, work focuses on analysis of security protocols, uh, survivability analysis, intrusion detection, formal methods for security, and analyzing uh, malicious code. And recently, he focused on privacy and adversarial machine learning. He has published uh, many influential papers and win many best paper and distinguished paper awards. And the last but not least, Professor Jia is a fellow of the ACM and the IGB. So Professor Jia, uh, over to you. Uh, thanks, Neil, that was a great intro. I, uh, one thing I wanted to say is that uh, I think it makes for a better talk if people can just unmute and ask or put stuff in chat. We can, I'm okay with asking questions as we speak. Otherwise, the talk appears very sterile so I, I, I think I'm okay with interaction during the talk and in fact, prefer it. So today we will talk about uh, sort of the security, um, why trustworthy machine learning needs a security mindset. And I view this uh, talk as a little bit, of, almost like a little bit of a therapy session for me, because you know it, I will also vent some of my frustration um, there is a, this disconnect between machine learning and the security slash crypto community. And some of that frustration will um, probably come through in the talk. And so this is also a therapy session for me. So you guys are my therapists and I'm the patient. Okay, so the key takeaway, if I, if I have sort of um, conveyed these messages to the end, to, towards the end of the talk, I have succeeded. So what I want to do is we need more system security and crypto and privacy folks to be crossing over to machine learning to give to bring some of that mindset. And we need more systematic ways of evaluating resilience of ML components, similar like what we have for analyzing symmetric crypto systems or static dynamic analysis for security um, components in machine learning, okay? So if I, have, if I have made, this is kind of the case I want to make in my talk. And if I made that case, I have succeeded. And I hopefully I do better than these two people in making my case uh, than what they did for uh, their agenda. By the way, I, I put this, I, had, I, I was giving this talk in, uh, to an Indian audience and somehow that joke went flat. So hopefully, uh, you, uh, people here under, know who these two people are. Okay, uh, I don't want to say too much here. ML is being used everywhere. And believe it or not, a few years back, this was, the, I had to say that, but I don't need to say that anywhere. ML is being used in every sector. Now, our story begins uh, in 2013, and you must have seen these articles coming out in popular press that, hey, ML is re re reaching human level performance in 2013, you know, breaking captures, um, recognizing objects and faces and so on. And you must have seen these articles were coming out. Um, and uh, this is 90% uh, of my family is are real doctors. Uh, they say I'm a fake doctor, I'm not a real doctor. And so this is for them, uh, 2017, uh, a lot of uh, sort of articles coming out that they were even beating doctors for certain things like reading, uh, you know, diagnosing uh, by radiologists and so on and so forth, right? 
Okay, so now and around the same time or then within a few years, people started realizing that, hey, in adversarial settings, um, there is something weird going on when you use ML. So I'm, I'm sure I don't want to say too much here, but you must have seen these uh, chat bots where you can poison some of the data and they will start tweeting things um, that are objectionable. Uh, well, given the last four years, you know, these appear like normal tweets. Um, and then, you know, you can um, sort of bypass YouTube filtering algorithms uh, by just small manipulations. And obviously, if you use ML in, um, you know, things like autonomous driving, then adversary can be present there. Okay. And uh, uh, you know there there is an increased rise of ML in CPS or cyber physical systems, and this is the kind of the chart that shows that. And obviously here you don't even have to motivate what you know there can be adversities present in the in the in the um, in sort of um, in the nature or and for example think about drones flying in a hostile territory, right? Obviously, an adversary will try to uh, fool that drone. Uh, okay, so uh, now, uh, and this is kind of when we, I got into this field of think about ML sort of meeting security, privacy, crypto, and uh, there was a there's a colleague here. Uh, his name is Jerry Zhu, probably ML people know him quite well. Uh, he basically, he also is in, has started working in this field, but he kind of asked me this provocative question saying, okay, what is, what is the DNA? What is the difference about security, privacy, and crypto people than regular ML people, okay? Um, and, you know, I, I sort of start thinking about it. And here are some of the things that I think distinguishes our, the community. When I say our, I mean, I, I publish in ML places, but I primarily consider myself part of uh, this, this community, SPC community, is that we have a mindset which kind of works like this. When we, when we put together a solution or a defense for something, we have the following components in mind, right? We have some system or a primitive. We have a security goal, G, and I will give some examples. And we have a threat model, which basically is sort of a kind of a formal way of saying what an attacker can do. And we have some security assumptions. So in crypto, uh, these security assumptions can be very formal. In systems, the security assumption might be like, hey, um, some protected part of memory cannot be tampered with or, or so on and so forth. And um, our security arguments and proofs roughly go like this, right? They say that if an attacker can violate the security assumption um, in a threat model, then in somehow they have can solve some hard problem or has violated uh, sort of the, um, the security assumption, like overwrote the memory they were not supposed to. Now, I just want to make sure, so uh, make sure one thing that every security proof doesn't Security paper doesn't have a formal proof, but in some sense, even in words, we at least a good security paper tries to argue that, hey, uh, there might be something, um, if you can violate my system, then you, you're violating some security assumption that I have. Now, how do systems and primitives get broken? Uh, obviously, if you have some shoddy proofs and arguments, then you know your system can be broken. Your threat model can be too weak, right? Um, your security assumption is not valid. So if you, if the crypto people probably uh, know that a lot of the lattice-based crypto systems of early things were broken because some of the problems that they were um, sort of assuming was actually they were they could be solved in poly poly time. The instances they were using could be solved in poly time. 
Now, uh, the last one is the more interesting one, is some very ingenious attacks are found. So think about the first, uh, when power analysis paper came from Paul Kocher, which basically said that by looking at the power consumption of a crypto algorithm, that is can be acted as a side channel and I can use that to break and infer the key, right? Uh, the ROP gadgets paper of Hobab Shakam, uh, uh, which basically said that I can use existing gadgets in my programs to kind of construct an attack and I don't need to inject new code, right? So these were, these kind of very ingenious creative attacks is what moves our field forward, okay? And I want you to remember that. In security and crypto, a lot of the new, very, very clever attacks are kind of a driver for our field, if you will, okay? So in this, this attack fix cycle is, is very, very kind of almost like the, in the DNA of the, our SPC field, okay? And at least I don't, and you know, some of my papers have been attacked and I don't take it personally. I was like, okay, yeah, you know, that's an attack. Let's kind of uh, move forward. Obviously you don't want too much of that, but this is something that is in our DNA. You know, I, for example, uh, I'm assuming Ashwin or Mike are in the audience. If I, you know, if I find a weakness in one of their papers or something like that, uh, they're not going to come after me and, you know, saying, oh, you know, I don't, you don't know what you're talking about. And, you know, your mother is ugly as well, right? I mean, you know, they, they don't, we, they don't take it personally. What I feel, find is that that is not true. And that's where there's a big rub. And I think they don't, like, I think if you attack somebody's paper and they're not in this field, they, they tend to take it very personally. And I'll give you a little bit, I will, we'll talk about the Insta hide stuff more later, but when this Spectre meltdown attack came out, I, I still remember we had a speaker in our department and we have a very strong architecture group. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, um, they basically, oh, this, this, thing, this thing is just a curiosity. And, you know, what is this? And uh, like, you know, they basically were like, okay, you know, there's, it's not, they basically were insinuating like, okay, this is not a realistic attack. Okay, there's some academic writing papers. This is really not realistic. Well, guess what? <laughs> now, I, I think I was, I was looking at, uh, with one of our architecture folks, I was looking at ISCA and you know, whatever micro proceedings. And, you know, every third paper was about this, you know, defense about this. So, but I think the original, from what I can remember, even I was talking to somebody from that meltdown specter uh, field, they, they, they did, the, the architects didn't take that very well initially, at least, okay? Now, uh, you know, this is, um, I took this goofy picture of Nikita Borisov. Um, I, I don't want to say that every security paper has this kind of a proof that I talked about, but this, this kind of, at least we have this uh, ethos of having a threat model, some security assumption, and um, some argument. It doesn't have to be a formal proof. Okay, um, so what I'm going to talk about is that there is that lot of the, 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 the problems in trustworthy machine learning are coming about because this mindset of this attack fix cycle and, you know, attacks being, you know, in some sense, and I had a discussion with Mike Reiter about this in our one-on-one, -on -one, attacks are considered part of our field, right? There's, if you look at our conferences, we have a lot of attack papers. Um, and, 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 you know, that is missing in, in machine, in, in sort of, at least in machine learning. Attacks are almost considered a little bit of a curiosity by the machine learning researchers and not saying, oh, you know, there are these academics just doing this stuff. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that my, my thesis is that we need that more of that mindset. In, in the ML part. And I will talk about that uh, through, the, through the lens of a couple of the papers that I was recently involved in. And hopefully some of my frustration will uh, 
will boil through and you will see some of that. Neil, I think there is something in the, I'm not monitoring the chat. Hopefully you're monitoring the chat if there are any questions. Uh, yeah, Michael was uh, joking. <laughs> okay. When you, when you say uh, you can attack, uh, you can attack his paper and he's fine. <laughs> okay, okay, good, good. <laughs> uh, Mike and I know each other for too long. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, so let me just drop, give a background. Uh, there is this uh, algorithm called differentially private uh, stochastic gradient descent and uh, people probably in privacy and ML know about it. And I've given a short description here. Um, so these two papers that I'm going to talk about, InstaHide and NeuroCrypt, if DP SGD had no accurate, so what happens is if you use differentially private stochastic gradient descent, on realistic data sets, uh, the accuracy drop is too much, okay? So for example, on CIFAR 10, the last time I checked, uh, maybe somebody has improved it, the accuracy drop was 20%, okay? Now, these papers like InstaHide and NeuroCrypt that I'm going to talk about uh, were, were proposed because DPSGD in some sense with very large data sets has too much of an accuracy drop. So in some sense, it doesn't work. In fact, I think this is not new. I was talking to a friend of mine who's in the ML healthcare space. He has a startup and they use DPSGD as a first thing uh, for their medical data set and the accuracy drop was just too much, okay? And uh, a related paper, uh, uh, Florian Tramer and Bonet had a paper in ICLR 2021 where they found that um, if you just use good feature engineering with standard linear models, they were breeding DPSGD with deep learning models. I don't know whether the people have seen it. So uh, I, I don't want to sort of say here that DPSGD is bad or anything, but the, the reality is that on realistic models, the accuracy drop is too much due to training the model using DPSGD, okay? And if this was not true, if the accuracy drop was reasonable, in some sense that takes away a lot of the motivations for these alternative things like InstaHide and uh, you know, Okay, so the first work I'm going to talk about is joint work with these great co-authors, which was at Oakland 2021. Um, I called it InstaHide Break, but um, the title of the paper is something very sterile, like, oh, does, does instant encoding work or something like that, right? <laughs> Actually, well, few of our co-authors wanted to call it uh, something like InstaHide doesn't work, but you know, through consensus, we came up with a sterile title. Um, so, but this is the non-sterile title. Okay. Uh, and again, I, I don't want you to focus too much on the specifics of the break, but I want you to connect to the previous one that how, um, you know, how the machine learning community had misses some of that mindset. So let's talk a little bit, very short about that. So, uh, you know, we know machine learning, you have basically uh, some concept which labels some data, and then you learn an algorithm which is supposed to approximate the concept. I'm not gonna get too much into that. And the idea is, can we make this process private? DPSGD is one way of doing it, but as we saw, the accuracy drop is too much. So uh, some researchers are looking at what is called instance encoding algorithms and uh, roughly speaking these encoding algorithms encode the image before they are fed into the learning algorithm and the intuition here is that because this encoding in an image is kind of scrambling in some sense the images they are kind of removing the private content so you're learning your sort of algorithm your learning algorithm is not basing itself on some private data. Okay, so that's kind of the basic high level idea here. Um, um, and the idea is that if this encoding algorithm is quote unquote private, uh, it's not revealing sensitive information, then the learning algorithm is by definition private. That's kind of the high level view, okay? Um, you know, the, the benefit is very 
easy, right? What you do is suppose I'm a healthcare company. I know Duke uh, has a very strong medical school. I have some data set. Um, one of my very good uh, buddies uh, who used to, I used to work with David Page, uh, is now at Duke uh, Medical, is I have a data set which I want others to kind of learn models on. I encode them, I put it out there and you know, you kind of do your learning algorithm and you know, you're not learning private information. Um, and that's kind of, and you know, you can see if such an encoding scheme existed, that would be great, right? Um, what we are first going to show is one of the first and such encoding schemes was uh, something called InstaHide, uh, which was due to these authors, um, which was an ICML 2020, and which won the Bell Labs Prize. <clears throat> and here is how InstaHide kind of roughly works. Um, we are going to tackle kind of two questions here. Is InstaHide the specific algorithm private? And can anything similar to InstaHide be private? That's the two questions we try to answer in the Oakland paper. Um, InstaHide algorithm is actually, the algorithm itself is quite clever. What it basically does is, um, let's say you, you take your image and you randomly mix images so you have two data sets. One is private, think about that as healthcare, and public, which you get from Instagram or you know, maybe from your web page or whatever. And you uh, mix, uh, you take your image uh, and you mix it up with some images from public, some image from private. And um, in this mix algorithm, they, they take one from public and one, uh, two, two from public, two from private. Okay, now this is not new. There is a paper called Mixup, which is um, a paper from Google. So this is basically Mixup, the Mixup algorithm. And I think the, probably the ML people know about this. Okay, and you get some sort of the scrambled image. And then what you do is you randomly flip the signs of the pixels. Okay, and you get this. And that is their encoding algorithm. So the encoding algorithm is basically Mixup plus flipping the signs of the pixels, okay? And then that is what you feed into your learning algorithm. And uh, which was actually, I was kind of surprised that this mix up plus random flipping was still giving pretty good accuracy, okay? It was giving very good accuracy. The accuracy drop from what I remember was only like a couple of percent on CIFAR 10 or something like that. So, um, you know, this looks kind of like, oh yeah, you know, they're kind of scrambling the images and then randomly flipping the pixels, you know, it's not keeping, and, and this is the end. If you look at the encoded images, they don't look anything like the images that you were started out with. So, you know, like at least to a naked eye, these look very scrambled and, you know, there's probably give, getting rid of private information, but we kind of show that, no, what happens is, uh, and you know, intuitively, right? If these these scrambled images are keeping some signal about the images, which the learning algorithm is leveraging. So we kind of uh, sort of exploit that, and we came up with a clustering algorithm which can take encoded images and cluster similar images that encoded images that came from kind of the same seed image. And then we use these clusters to recover the original image, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, you can go, go to the paper. We, we were actually able to come pretty close to um, the, you know, you can see on the top, the original image and then the bottom, the extracted image, okay? Now the second part of the paper in Oakland was more saying, okay, InstaHide, we were able to kind of break um, and can something like InstaHide work, right? Not, not exactly that algorithm, but maybe there is a different instantiation of that kind of uh, algorithm. And uh, what we did is, um, I mean, the crypto people will uh, probably 
look at this game, and this this is very similar to uh, the semantic security game that we do for like in CPA or something like that. If you probably teach it in your class. Um, so so the idea is what we did is uh, we defined a crypto game which uh, works as follows. The challenger gives us two images. Um, <clears throat> we encode these images and give one of these encodings to the challenger. And from the encoded image, they have to say whether it's this dog or you know, the white dog or the black dog, right? So think about encoding as giving, so the, like if people who are do sort of crypto, this is like, you know, when, when in the in CPA game, the attacker picks two messages and I encrypt one of them and they have to say, uh, which one, this is similar. So the attacker's game is to look at the encoded image and say which one it is, whether it's this or that, okay? Uh, obviously the encoding was able to get rid of all the private information, then you would say that you know the attacker cannot do better than random guessing, right? If you can do better than random guessing, that means encoding had some information about the original image. So we, we kind of have a formal definition in our paper about that. And we show that the following kind of theorem, that if the learning algorithm and the protocol achieve better than random accuracy, okay? On two concept functions, C1 and C2. So for example, in our previous one, let's say the two concept functions are one concept function says whether it's a dog or not. The second concept function says what color of the dog. If your learning protocol See, remember the learning protocol is the learning algorithm and the encoding function does better than random accuracy on two concept functions. Then we have a polynomial time adversary that can break that, can win that game with better than random accuracy. So that means the encoding is leaking some of that information, okay? And the idea is actually not that hard. Uh, if your security game uses the concept C1, then I use C2 to leverage and, and win that game. And we have a version of this game as well, which is uh, for, for accuracy on the original data, not just on the encoded data, okay? Um, and um, I'm going to wait. Uh, so we solve the insta height challenge. Um, now the, the thing is, well, does this invalidate insta height security claims? And at least on paper, no, because there was no formal, like, you know, in, in, in sort of like a crypto pro, uh, sort of paper, right? You would say, oh, if you can break my scheme, then you can solve, I don't know, some short, shortest vector problem in a lattice or something. They didn't have that kind of a proof or something in the paper. So in some sense, we solved the challenge but you know, does it invalidate insta height security claims? By definition, no, because they didn't have a formal claim in their paper. Okay, any questions so far? Um, before I moved on to a different one, I just want to say that uh, uh, there was a huge discussion between the insta height authors and the authors of our paper, and also a huge Twitter discussion uh, I think Ashwin was part of that discussion as well, the Twitter discussion. It and started off as a, started well, as a blog discussion because both Cynthia Dwork and Adam Smith were not on Twitter and then it went to Twitter later. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you can just Google insta hide attack and you will see all that. And to me, what that showed is just the mindset difference. The insta hide folks don't still believe that their stuff is broken. In fact, there are, I saw there were a lot of follow-up submissions in New in uh, New Diff this time on Inside, and I think there is a mindset difference here. That, um, for example, I'll, I'll just give you an anecdote. So, um, and probably uh, the crypto people in the audience, like Kartik and Mike, uh, you can back me up on this. That some of the initial attacks on the iterated hash functions, like MD5, they were not even attacking the full hash function. The collisions were found in one iteration of the hash function, okay? 
but the crypto community got very nervous and they were you know that's when they started looking at other sort of um, you know i don't know uh other other candidates and so on and so forth i mean so uh i i think the insta hype folks their response was that okay this was like an sort of an a team of academics with phd's with a lot of resources because nicholas carlini is at google brain uh, an average attacker will not be i think i'm just summarizing some of the discussion the average attacker is not going to be able to attack them you know that's kind of their discussion and you know i think that the problem there is that you know what if i don't know nicholas puts his code out there right uh, which he didn't but um, then what right i mean then the, somebody can just use it and this is what happens in the security community right the initial attack is very ingenious but then everybody starts using it because you know in some sense one person paid the you know the creativity cost and everybody's um, uh, doing from that so I, I to me the all that discussion was more than sort of individual i mean it it did get personal at times but to me it was showing that mindset difference that you know what what a community considers attack and what another community considers an attack i'm going to stop here for a few questions and then move on to another one yeah <clears throat> yeah so much i have a question yeah that's yeah. very inspiring and interesting but as a community how do we move forward what are your suggestions like how no, can i we... don't know i i really don't know because what happens is that you know uh, uh, I, I mean i i'll be honest i mean for example i i have had one on uh, sanjeev varoda recently gave a um a distinguished lecture in our uh, our department which was nothing to do with insta hype it was more on theory of deep learning and i had my one on one with him and actually i mean he's sincere he doesn't believe insta hype was broken <laughs> okay I see. yeah so you know i mean what do you do i mean it's like uh i mean i i think that we are i i i'm i'm at a uh, to be honest i'm at an impasse if some other people have a sort of a benefit at i mean his the point they were making is that if the attacker's cost goes from 5 bucks to I, i'm just making 5 5 as a uh 5 dollars to 20 dollars then they think that's that's progress but my Uh, the, the thing is these attacks will keep getting better and they're going to be out there so that cost keeps going down so i don't know i i don't know neil i don't have a good answer for your question actually okay yeah sure yeah i think uh, it's just uh, just just a total miss uh, i think there's a mismatch in mindsets if you will mm, yeah. um for example i'll i'll uh, tell you this um, so if you i don't know whether you guys remember there's there's this paper by athale carlini and wagner in icml actually it even won the best paper award where mm -hmm. they broke seven out of eight schemes from previous iclr i i forget what the name of the exact paper is mm -hmm. and actually the authors of those schemes of those seven out of eight some of them i know very well they don't think their scheme was broken actually <laughs> okay so i don't know what you do right Mm -hmm. uh they still keep working on um uh, the same thing yeah, and actually that has been a cause of a lot of frustration to be honest because i will talk a little bit about the next paper uh very quickly and then i will get into a discussion which i really do want to have there was another uh, and by the way one thing i wanted to again bring up is look these are the authors of these papers like insta hide and the other one that neurocrypt these are not these are you know these are these are top notch i mean folks right but this is not uh you know these are not like you know with with sort of this the sparkling credentials right these are and if i if they are not convinced then like uh, like a like a how would you convince somebody who doesn't have that kind of a deep background so i think this is what i was saying there's a mismatch of mindset which i don't know how to bridge um um it was funny i was giving this talk somewhere and janet said this is like uh vaxers versus anti vaxers uh you know you cannot ever bring them together um i hope it is not that bad um 
So we have another paper called NeuroCrypt is not private, which is was at um, privacy preserving PPML workshop. Um, now this uh, is also an instance encoding scheme, but this has a quote unquote a key. It's a keyed uh, encoding scheme. Uh, so you take a data set, you encode it with a key and um, you, you, you learn. So I think the difference between these kind of schemes and NeuroCrypt is that they have a key. And this was the paper. Uh, this is the paper. Again, I want you to point, see that this is not some, I mean, these are people with sparkling credentials and sort of top-notch folks, right? And we had the exact same discussion with them. Uh, and um, I will just briefly touch on it. Um, and I'll sort of speed through it because I want to get to the discussion part a little bit more. Um, essentially, the key is some sort of a random weights of a neural network. And they use that to encode um, the images. And then the story is the same as InstaHype. You will learn over these encoded images. And they were getting very uh, good results. And they, they said that they, they had a lot of healthcare companies interested in it, in their paper and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, and um, they, do, they do have some definitions and they basically prove, they have a formal definition which basically says that the encoding of two images with the same label are kind of indistinguishable. And I'm not going to delve into it too much. And their threat model is that, so uh, one thing is that, you know, I guess, there are some crypto people on that paper. So they were, they were much more explicit about their threat model. Um, so the, the, the idea is that the adversary sees a plain text X and an encoded version and must not be able to learn anything else beyond the labels of, um, of the data set. Okay. Now they do have a proof of their scheme, but it is in there for an ideal encoding. And in some sense, the NeuroCrypt they claim in the paper approximates this ideal encoding. But this is where the rub is. There is, a, there is, a, there is kind of this disconnect there. Uh, NeuroCrypt is kind of an instance of an ideal encoding, but it's really, really not because they're kind of, uh, this is an instance of it. And this instance is kind of um, um, was what we broke. And I, I'm not gonna get into too much. They had two challenges. One was given a 10,000 images, and their encoding, you had to match which and which image corresponded to which encoding. Challenge two was kind of, I thought it was weird. It was like full key recovery attack. The idea was I encode my image using a key and you have to find another key K prime that is approximate of the key K. So this would be something like uh, in, in the crypto lingo, I will give you a bunch of zipper text and I want to find, you want to find a key, which to me kind of makes uh, less sense. So we didn't tackle challenge two. And there also we had a lot of discussions with authors um, because we feel like challenge two is, is, is not a realistic challenge. So challenge one, we were able to break, okay, completely. Um, and um, the high, high level idea is very similar to InstaHide. Uh, essentially, even the encoded images have some signal in them, which we were able to use to train an embedding so that the embedding of the actual image and the encoded image was similar and use that embedding to actually break. Um, and then, then once you have the embedding, which is like a similarity match between uh, your encoded image and the actual image, you can then just do a normal mix and match and, and find those, those things, okay? Uh, you know, this is kind of interesting to me is that, you know, if you can use neural networks as a good guy, well, you know, bad guy can also use neural networks. So this is kind of like a good example of that. Um, now challenge two, as I told you, it didn't make sense to us because it was very akin to full key recovery attack given cipher text. So we actually didn't, uh, we didn't tackle that. Um, and we had some big discussion in our paper saying that, for example, suppose I have an encryption scheme, uh, encoding algorithm that takes X and a key K and my encoding is 
gives you the image in the same image, but replaces it, the second one with the PRF. Well, you cannot solve the challenge too, but obviously the scheme is broken. So it, we have a lot of examples in our paper which basically try to say that challenge two is not very interesting. So we didn't attack challenge two. Um, and again, we had similar theorems like what we had for Instahide for um, NeuroCrypt that a similar Instahide style algorithm, um, uh, will it work? And actually the, the, the punchline here is very simple. Um, it, that if an encoding algorithm gives you a good accuracy, then in some sense, it already must know the labeling algorithm, then why the heck are you encoding? You just sort of, uh, you know, there's no, no need for learning. And I'm not gonna get into it uh, too much. Uh, okay, so summary is NeuroCrypt is not private, at least according to us. The authors completely disagree with us. Uh, and challenge two is, was not relevant to us, um, at least as a security, and doing having some crypto background, it was not. I, it was to me a nonsensical kind of a challenge. And again, we had a same sort of a frustrating discussion here with the authors. We went back and forth, and we said, "Hey, we broke it." They said, "Yeah, you broke this instance of NeuroCrypt, but it is your job to show that no possible instance like NeuroCrypt is going to work." Well, that is not our job as a security person, that's kind of your job, right? So I think it was again, very sort of like really a lot of kind of this back and forth where we, I don't think we still convinced them that NeuroCrypt was both. Again, so, so the same thing that with InstaHype, they, uh, they kind of don't think it is broken even though we solved their challenge. <laughs> uh, and again, we are at the same impasse. And from, from what I know, they, 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 you know, the community, they were like, is still working on uh, InstaHype plus NeuroCrypt um, stuff. So, uh, you know, hopefully this, this tells you that um, we, uh, we ML security crypto folks need to infiltrate ML people, uh, which, we, which I'm trying to do, but hopefully more of you can do it, um, uh, you know, uh, and uh, we need to sort of, uh, I hope I'm not pissing off some of the ML people in the audience. Um, we we need if we need more people to infiltrate that community. It almost it sounds more like a DoD lingo. So and and again, as Ashwin was pointing out, if you want, you just sort of also look at the comments of this uh, the the blog that uh, uh, Sanjeev Arora has. Um, so. And I just want to so instance encoding is not an isolated case. There are many informal such ML security notions that people are using in watermarking, model theft, black box invasion. And, um, you know, frankly, uh, I was talking to Nicholas Carlini about it. I mean, we, the security, the people who are into breaking these things, we are running out of energy. I can see some papers, and you know, I can immediately see how I can attack some of them, but do I want to write yet another paper about it? I, I, I don't want to. Um, and um, uh, so let's now get into a discussion phase where hopefully you can ask me some questions. So, you know, the, at least one good thing is some of these papers are putting out security challenge, which is good, right? But security challenge is not, a substitute for a security proof or an argument, okay? Uh, so, um, you know, you, you have to at least give me some falsifiable security claim on a formal threat model. And not, a, all I want to say is a challenge is a good thing, but it is not a substitute for that. And let me give you an argument, right? This is the standard game I actually, I think this, this we, I picked from Lyndall Kautz's book. This is a, a sort of a standard crypto game style for encryption schemes where uh, the crypto people will see that's the second one is, um, the first one is generating the key. The second is the adversary picks two messages. 
then I encrypt one of them, and then the adversary has to guess. B prime is the guess. Uh, well, you know, when you prove something is secure, you're proving that no possible attacker can win this game by more than half plus negligible probability, right? Uh, a security uh, a challenge is just one instance. So you cannot replace a security proof by just one possible challenge, okay? Uh, so for example, right, if, if in, people put out factoring challenges, just because I cannot solve a factoring challenge doesn't prove that RSA, you know, if you solve a factoring challenge, that doesn't show that RSA is not CCS secure. You know, okay? Uh, so, no, no, sorry. If you solve a factoring challenge, it shows that RSA is not CCS secure, but not other way around, right? So, because a challenge is just one instance of a problem. Uh, so, for example, like Zodiac Cypher, you know, most crypto people would think that it's not a secure cipher, but it withstood crypto analysis for 50 years, right? Um, because it didn't have a formal security claim. So, you know, we need to move, maybe in trustworthy machine learning, we, we need to be moving where we use formal definitions, argument analysis proof, like in crypto security, um, and go sort of like, you know, so that at least I can, I will have some basis of saying whether your scheme is secure or not. And we need to go beyond, right now, a lot of the papers, what they do is they take existing attacks and just apply them and say, oh, look, existing attacks didn't work very well. We need to go beyond that and look at adaptive attacks saying at least, hey, what, what is, what, what can an attacker do who knows the details about your defense algorithm? Might not, not know exactly the randomness you're using, just like, you know, I don't know the exact key. Um, like just saying that, you know, we know this in the security community, but a lot of the ML people still are using this. Oh, you don't know what my defense algorithm is so that, you know, you, my stuff is secure. I mean, like security by obscurity, right? Now, one thing which is, kind of frustrating for me is that, you know, there used to be these old fields, probably uh, Mike knows about these like information hiding, like watermarking. A lot of the schemes there got broken and those ideas keep resurfacing now. And they are not very cognizant of some of those old attacks. And for example, I just recently saw a paper at one of the top security venues, I won't say which one, and it was very clear to me that some of these old attacks can be used here, but they were not even familiar that there used to be a field called information hiding in security, which is less common now. So, you know, at least be cognizant of these older fields. But I think the biggest thing is, and I'm open to ideas here, there is a there is an impedance mismatch between the mindset of a person who is trained completely in machine learning and a person who's trained in security, crypto, privacy, where to the point where even if you attack their system, they don't think it is an attack. And I don't know what to do with that impedance mismatch, to be honest. Um, and uh, on that note, I want to get ideas from all of you on what we should do about this impedance mismatch of security, um, crypto mindset and the ML mindset and open to questions. Yeah, thanks for the inspiring talk, Sumesh. So now, uh, oh, Mike, Mike has a question. Yeah, yeah thanks for the talk, Sumesh. Um, so very thought provoking. Uh, so I guess what I'm curious about is how important you think it is that that we as a collective computer science community reach agreement on things like this um is it really that critical that the authors of these schemes and the authors of the attacks really reach common ground or is this just commentary on a published scheme and the eventual user of this technology can decide for themselves well you know so 
it's a little bit dangerous. So uh, let me give you an anecdote, right? So I was talking to somebody from a healthcare company, which I, I won't name. They were seriously thinking of using Instaheim. Because think about it, right? The paper comes from a, you know, top-notch folks. I mean, I, I hope you would agree with that. And from Princeton University, they'll say, oh, look at that. This is so simple. Like, you know, it's like a thousand lines of Py PyTorch code and, you know, I can just use it. I think to me, that is the, be that is the biggest thing that, you know, it might start getting used um, and, you know, it's, it's like the following, right? That, uh, you, you know, and, and to me, that is the big danger. I don't mind that we have a vigorous discussion between the two groups. I think that's good. But to me, what is the bigger challenge is that, I mean, think about somebody sitting in the medical field, right? Will they actually go through, I mean, you know, as Ashwin pointed out, will they go through this whole Twitter discussion and all that stuff going on? Or they'll say, oh, this is from like, you know, top-notch folks from Princeton University Ivy League school. I'm just going to use it. And then later they publish some data set, which is uses that encoding. And then, you know, I, I'm able to find out that some sensitive info, information about Mike Ryder and then, you know, do something crazy. I think to me, that is the bigger thing, but I don't know. I, do you have a follow-up on, on that, on your thing? And no, no, I, I guess, I don't know. We can take it offline. I mean, my, I, I'm thinking about various different related things. I've seen, I, I mean, one of the reasons I asked the question is because I, I've seen cases even in the security community with people who ought to have a more similar mindset where they really couldn't reach agreement on, is this really broken or not? Um, yeah, that's true. that's true. And so, you know, I, I mean, while I think it's good as a community to do that analysis, and, and I think we also have to just agree to disagree in some cases as to whether or not this really counts as a break. Um, well, so in this case, yeah. I didn't have, we didn't have any option because the, the other group doesn't think it is broken, so. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, yeah, but I, yeah, I, I agree with you, but I think also we have to be very careful because privacy is slightly different, Mike, than, than sort of crypto in a system setting because think about a, like some hospital uses InstaHide, puts the data out there on the web saying, hey, medical researcher, we encoded your stuff using um, um, InstaHide, go and train your model. And then suddenly there's a data breach because once you release the data, that is for perpetuity. Sure, no, I understand. It's not, you cannot take it back. You cannot unsee it, so to speak. Sure. Which is different than finding a vulnerability in like a system. You know, I can sort of patch. Here, I released my data set. Well, it's out there. So yeah, we can take it, I, but it's a good question. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, thanks for the discussion, guys. Yeah, I think next one is Ashwin. Hi, Ashwin. Hi, Samesh. Yeah, thanks for the participation talk. Uh, I mean, I live and breathe this almost every day of my life. So it's great to see someone else fighting the same fight. <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, but I think to show the at, at least right? I can like, tell you that my co-authors have given up. They said, oh, we don't want to do anything because these guys don't change anything. So <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree. It's the same thing. Like, for example, uh, when, you, when people are talking about releasing statistics or like synthetic data uh, using using un, unproven techniques, like every time somebody releases it, you can go break it, but it just becomes challenging to like motivate yourself to do a new break. Yeah. Yeah. I think one question that you that you raised was like, what do we do in this in this situation, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's really it, it's I think it's a wasted effort trying to talk to you know the authors of these papers. That's what we found. Um, well, because because authors of these like papers, a, they have they have a vested they have a interest, incentive to kind of defend exactly. Themselves. 
they have an incentive to defend themselves. And the challenge is, especially when these authors are really prolific, mm -hmm. anything they say will come with some weight. And so by engaging with them directly, you're actually making your argument a little weaker because whatever they say, people will think is, other people may think it's right. And so it's hard to, and then things, uh, it becomes very sort of uh, non-technical and personal. Yeah. So, so at least for differential privacy, which is the fight that I fight, and mm -hmm. millions of these uh, kinds of arguments keep happening every day for us, mm -hmm. we don't directly engage with the people who are, who are actually generating these arguments, but rather mm -hmm. just appeal to the community and try to change the community's uh, mindset rather than those authors' mindset. Because directly engaging with them is a, is a, has, no, no, but that, has been but a disaster think... before. But Ashwin, I think I will tell you what, where the challenge there is, that if you look at um, like ICML, NeurIPS, that community, right? There are much fewer people there like you. So in some sense, they can drown you out. So that's why I was yeah. saying more, more people like you should be right. entering that community. Yeah, this takes time though. I mean, you can't, you can't change it overnight. Like, uh, for example, the, the, the theoretical proofs about, you know, why you need differential privacy 20 years ago, even today, people create all these focus, hokey schemes that, that claim to work very well. Yeah. So this does take time. So it has to be, you have to be patient. Yeah, good, good point. I, I think, but all I'm saying is maybe you should start public. I think maybe you should start publishing more in ICML and NeurIPS. <laughs> Because we need, I mean, for example, it is, there are very few people, there, there is a community now growing, but uh, there are very few people, there is, there's a small, like I know the DP people published there, but the community is still much smaller than the, than the broader ML community in general. Okay, yeah. Uh, so the next one is Miller Slav. Yeah, Miller Slav, go ahead. Um, so following back on the on the previous discussion, I, I mean, this is not unique to this kind of impedance mismatching. It's not unique for ML slash security privacy. I mean, even it's, I mean, it happens every time you have two communities meet. And for example, if you just switch now on the on the other side, if you look at, let's say, security privacy and CPS. Um, mm -hmm. CPS, you talk about robotics, autonomous systems, autonomy, you have longitudinal analysis is critical. You have to look at over, over time, over certain timeline, which really then means that you have to look at adaptive attacks. You have to look at this kind of um, worst case analysis that takes into account uncertainty of the environment and to look at these kind of things. And for example, from any kind of defense, is really not good enough if he just does the standard fail safe or robustness methods or all these other things. And for example, you can see this kind of impedance mismatch now between the, the, the CPS and, uh, and, uh, and the security community where if we are talking about defenses, you really have to have more of, of like kind of, for example, from CPS, you would come like kind of formal guarantees, you will come with with defenses that come with with stronger guarantees and and on the other side it'll be like more of oh it works because it works on something that anything else would work because it's not adaptive it's random and things like that so what i'm saying is uh, going back to 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 be more optimistic going back to to uh, to ashwin's comment over time people tend to like i know move into the other areas and then they spread their their opinions they spread their techniques and you can see how it changes the perspective and for example some of the things that would never pass uh, like i know that would easily pass five years ago now they cannot as easily pass in the in the in the cps or in the security community so i i, I don't think that the situation is that bad but it no, takes no. so i i agree with you uh, that the impedance mismatch is not kind of, uh, you know, unique here. I was just pointing it out. The, the, I'll tell you where the, the rub is. Um, you can just look at the community size, see like CAB, right? You and I, I mean, I also go to Popple and CAB. 
CAV is basically a workshop in ML. Yes. Okay. So the thing is, it's like there is an impedance mismatch between um, King Kong and a small animal. You see the difference? It's uh, it, the communities are not the same size. So what happens is that, uh, for example, right? I mean, you saw the co-authors of Insight. These guys are superstars in this community. And that community is huge, like much bigger than the, the, the community of which, you know, I publish in, you know, like you know, CCS, this and that. So it's, it's almost like uh, a lightweight boxer fighting a heavyweight boxer. So it's hard, that impedance mismatch gets sort of glory, you know, sort of uh, amplified. And I'm not sure that we will come to a conclusion as quickly as we did for CPS and security. I agree. Does that make sense? I agree, but if you just like, just like uh, again, slightly optimistic, although this is maybe a bit more pessimistic. Uh, look at like a shared autonomy and 2013, Mark saying like by 2016, we're gonna have autonomous cars on the street. Although it was obvious for anyone in the CPS community that that's not gonna happen. Uh -huh. um, so in some sense, economics and the reality, like always we have those like overshoots and then the reality settles things. A okay. few of the accidents, few of the leaks, etc. We cannot guarantee that those would not happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, going back to maybe the, the, the Ashwin's comment, I do believe that happened. And then we will react like we always reactively do things instead of proactively. And hopefully we will converge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope you, you're right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. One last uh, question. Huh? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, we know there are some parameters can bond the relationship between the accuracy and the privacy, such as the absolute in differential privacy. So I'm wondering, do you know uh, or ever think about a similar metric that can tie the relationship between robustness and the accuracy so that we can more easily to play the trade-off between them? Hmm. Are you, uh, say, can you repeat once more? I, I couldn't quite, quite catch your question. I mean, um, we have a, a, like a, in differential privacy, we can, you know, tune the epsilon, yeah. the parameter yeah. to, you know, to balance the trade-off between the accuracy and the, the privacy. Uh -huh. But in the robustness, is there any similar metric or paper parameters that we can play with to you know balance the yeah. trade-off between accuracy and robustness. I mean, generally, what they do is um, in robustness, the 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 analogous to epsilon is uh, the epsilon ball. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you say, okay, I'm only going to look at, at uh, attacks in this epsilon ball, and if this if the Epsilon is smaller, that means you only allow very small perturbation. Right. But um, you see what I'm saying, right? I, I think so like, for example, if Epsilon is zero, that means it basically becomes natural accuracy, right? So to me, um, and it is very clear that as Epsilon is smaller, you know, you can get better robust accuracy. Yeah, so I think there is a similar parameter in robustness which is which is epsilon if you look at um, which basically says how much you can perturb the image but i think uh, just to kind of follow up on that uh, people have been moving away from these epsilon lp norm attacks because the people are believing that that's not very realistic so people have been looking at robustness so for example i was just talking to uh, mike Ryder about it um, for example, if I have if I'm using ML for malware detection and I change a small amount of code in malware, that can result in a very big perturbation, right? Um, so, at least in the community, people are more looking at other kind of norms now. But yes, they, if you look at standard robustness, there is an akin there is an ana analogy to epsilon, which is the epsilon uh, ball.
Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, yeah, I think uh, that uh, ends our uh, talk uh, today. Yeah, so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thanks, yeah, thank you everyone for joining the talk. Okay, bye. Bye.